All right, Life Church Livonia, welcome to Tell Me More. I'm Alex, and today I'm joined by Kate Buckner. Kate Buckner. Here we are. <laughs> Is that your uh, theme song? No, I don't really have a theme song, but I'll come up with one. I do say da 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 a lot. I feel like your theme song might be like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, it goes like along that. that rhythm. That's a good <laughs> rhythm for me. <laughs> hey, what up, everybody? Pretty basic. What's up, guys? Glad you're here. If this is your first time on Tell Me More, we just want to say welcome. We're really glad you're here. And um, this podcast exists to create a space to have some more long form conversation uh, mm-hmm. about God's word and about um, what we're talking about at our church, Life Church Livonia, on Sundays. So this past week, we just finished, or I'm sorry, uh, the week before Thanksgiving, the 21st, we just finished a series called A New Way to Be Human as we looked at the Lord's, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I'm sorry, and we ended with the Lord's Prayer and simply looked at this new way to be human that Jesus calls us into through the Sermon on the Mount. We are ending uh, all of that content today with uh, the end of Matthew chapter 7. Next week, we're going to be starting this coming Sunday, starting a new series called Fear Not uh, on the Christmas story and about how uh, in the first Christmas, there were many things going wrong in the world uh, and many things to fear. But God shows up to the people of the first Christmas and sends an angel to say, fear not, for God is on the move. The things that look like the world is ending are actually totally at God's disposal, and God is moving in your midst. So we believe that is not just a word for them. It's a word for us today. So next week, we're going to be kicking that off, and we're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 1 as we talk about the first Christmas. But today... We are finishing with Matthew chapter 7 as we finish the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to share the screen. And Kate, would you just read our last section of scripture, the wise and foolish builders? Heck yeah, I will. I'd love to. Verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Mm, 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 mm. Good stuff. Real good stuff. So traditionally in Tell Me More, um, we will talk to whoever the pastor was who preached uh, the sermon for that weekend and and pick their brain a little bit deeper. But because uh, of the way we've done this past series this fall, we've instead um, often in Tell Me More, I've been talking about passages of scripture we didn't get to preach on in the weekend because there was just not enough time. Mm-hmm. There's so, so much, so much so to talk much, about. <laughs> so much. We even, yeah, we talked about maybe even coming back to it later in the year because it is just so thick. I don't think we're going to do that, but um, this has been how we've been going through the whole Sermon on the Mount. So today is one of the days where neither of us have preached on this text. And so mm-hmm. instead of picking one another's brain on what we already studied and preached, instead we're going to make some observations and questions as we study the text together. Mm-hmm. So Kate, tell me a little bit more about what stands out to you from this passage of Scripture. Yeah, so verse 24, I would say it starts off with therefore. So I want to check in and find out why is what's there, what is therefore, therefore. Um, and I would go back to 22, 23 and, and read that and say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So in verse 24, it takes that into context to say, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So what he's saying is that there's more than just saying, God, I know who you are. Um, 
to actually following Christ. So I think that that's the point of right there. So I would observe and say, what's there for, therefore? And I would say, well, because it's combining two thoughts. Um, and then he goes on um, to, to talk about uh, some external um, pressures that are coming on against this house. This is a parable. Mm-hmm. It's an example that he's mm-hmm. giving. So he's talking about rain and mm-hmm. streams and winds. And so I'd note that I'd write those things down. What, what could those things be? Um, for the listeners, because <clears throat> as we continue reading, he says there's two, ex- like he's comparing and contrasting two different right. um, examples. So I would, you know, jot down some thoughts about that, you know, foolish person versus a wise person. And mm-hmm. I write down that. And then the crowds are another uh, group of people that are being talked about in this. Um, I did think it's really interesting how he, um, Matthew is talking about um, the perspective of the crowds and the comparison between Jesus and yeah. the teachers of the law. Yeah. So I'd write that down and, and uh, pray about and think about that. So those are just some off, offhanded mm-hmm. um, observations that I'm making just in the quick preview mm-hmm. over the text that we've done. How about you? Yeah, I, this is the end of a sermon. So this, is, this whole past few chapters has been a verbal speech. And so when he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, he's referencing the everything he just said, all the way from the <laughs> Beatitudes to now. Oh, yeah. All and the way back. Okay. And that's a lot. I mean, because that's how he starts, right? It's a, it's a, it's a sermon he's speaking. Yeah, so at the end of this true. sermon, he goes, therefore. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't been listening You're up right. until now now tune in here <laughs> everyone who hears these words of mine these words being everything i just said everything about the beatitudes about the kingdom of god about being salt and light about not judging others about the way you handle anger about the way you handle conflict about the way you handle sexual purity about the, about everything yeah therefore everyone who hears what i'm saying and puts my words into practice is like, and then obviously, you know, he's using a simile here mm-hmm. to, to teach a spiritual truth, like a man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Yeah. And, um, I think that one of the things that strikes me as an observation in this is Jesus. So he's so um, wise because the Bible is not um, a series of stories that uh, teach us parabolic um, truths, right? It's not just a bunch of parables or proverbs. It's a worldview. It's a way of understanding reality. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that strikes me is Jesus is saying the the rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation. One of the things that strikes me is Jesus is separating the house from the weather that happens around the house. Yeah. And I think that uh, that strikes me because often we can have. Um, an undifferentiated sense of self that cannot see ourselves as separate from our storms. Right. That those things that I'm synonymous with the, the, both my successes and my failures. Absolutely. And, and those are good things too, right? Like successes. Yeah. We can, we can relate to those things, but it's when they start to define us and dictate our identity. Right. And so Jesus is pointing out, um, this man that, we are not the weather, we're the house, right? Mm-hmm. And and even, you could get even deeper into some of the symbolism of that, I won't, but um, Jesus is the reason. <laughs> but I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> well, going, okay, I will, I will then. Okay, a little so, bit, just a little bit, you know? So people, he, this is it. he says, uh, like a wise man who built his house. So Jesus is giving us... Um, Three, he's giving us two environments 
uh, a cause and effect in a person. So he, it's like he's saying, you are a person and every person is going to build a house. Every person will create an environment in which they live. <clears throat> and yeah. that a house symbolizes an immediate community. Our family is our first community and it's often our last community. It's where we're born and it's where we die. Yeah. And um, the house is a symbol of um, the center of my life. It's where I begin my life and it's where I end my life. And so Jesus is saying, you are like a person who is building a house. And you don't really get to choose whether or not you build a house in this parable. Mm, but you're all, gonna. all the parties in the parable <laughs> build a house. Yep. I think that's a symbol of all people build a house. Sure. All people build a form of home. We all build a life uh, that we live inside of, like this man lives inside this house. And that is separate from the inevitable storms that are going to happen to it. So there's, there's this triple separation of this man, this community, uh, this house, if you will, that he creates, and then its ability to withstand or not withstand reality. Because that's mm -hmm. the other thing. The storms <clears throat> are reality. And they're non-malicious. Whoa. Sorry about that. Okay, I forgive you. This Thank time. you. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, thank you. Thank anyway, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I forgot what I was saying. Then there's a man, there's a house. Oh, so that the house is separate from the storms that happen around it, but the storms are non malicious, right? We know that a storm is just a natural byproduct of the uh, earth preserving itself. Right. Like right. if it rains, that's not a bad thing. If it rains mm -hmm. a lot, that's not a bad thing. This is a normal, natural process of life. That's actually it's not, it's not like a vindictive attack no. against you. The that weather is not about happening. me. Right. And and again, there's this this symbolism of storms happen, period. Sometimes uh, there are parts of storms that are against me, that are personal, that are vindictive, that are relational, that are poison relationships. Uh, and, and sometimes not. But in this case, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew. This is just a storm. And it's likely uh, flood season. So like winter, right? Yep. It's just the, the way of life. Yet, it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So Jesus is saying this person's ability and this person's home, their, their life, their community, this, this place they've built to exist in right? Yeah. That, that thing's ability to withstand reality is dependent on what it is built on. Yep. Right. And then he goes on Absolutely. to contrast, but mm -hmm. everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. Now, uh, this, context sand uh especially in the middle east and in, in the israelite area is pretty common <laughs> it's pretty synonymous yeah um and it's not always easy to tell necessarily if it's if it's rock or sand you have to do a little bit of digging but jesus is um again just the characters in his parable there's a person there's a thing they build with their life in which their life exists there's the foundation that exists on and then the reality of trouble and hardship. Uh, and Jesus is saying the secret to, to being able to greet reality uh, as it is and not be torn down by it is right. to hear me and obey me. That's the secret. Yep. That's a secret. But I think also if we look and see, it says puts them into practice Right. So, so I think that it's about implementation of mm -hmm. what he's saying, allowing mm -hmm. that to change the way that you engage or mm -hmm. allow those things to affect you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, I think the foundation, he compares himself and his words to the foundation mm -hmm. of a house. Yep. And uh, I think that's so on purpose because we all have a foundation for our house. 
Mm-hmm. There are worldviews, understanding of right and wrong, understanding yeah. of true and false, understanding of what's, and just even big picture, every religion has to have two things in order to exist as a religion. Otherwise, it's just an opinion, or it's just <laughs> a, um, maybe a spiritual philosophy, but it's not a religion. A religion has to answer the question, what do we do with the problem of evil in the world? And then a religion has to answer the question, what is ultimately real? Hmm. What is li- what is the container that life exists in? That what is the thing that defines reality, right? So a Buddhist, for example, might answer that question by saying the problem of evil um, is that life is suffering, and what's ultimately real is you're born and reborn until you figure out um, how to live, um, not just enter nirvana but live nirvana right? To, to empty yourself and to be this um, shell for the universe to fill in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, every religion answers that question differently. Christians, and this is what Jesus is getting at here, Christians say um, that the Bible, the teachings of the Bible um, are how we answer those two questions. The problem of evil in the world comes from human sin. Mm-hmm. And that Jesus has come to take, to be the answer to that problem. And that what's ultimately real is that um, God exists in heaven. He has sent his son to earth and that he will judge the living and the dead for their sins. And that um, there is some, uh, a heavenly space and a space called hell in which people Um, will go as a response to the life they've chosen to live. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's how the Bible answers the question of what's ultimately real and what do we do with the problem of evil? And Jesus is saying um, that all the things he just said on the sermon, in this sermon on the Mount Mm -hmm. are the foundation for a life that doesn't fall apart. And one of the things I find interesting too, is that, um, one of the major responses to reality in the modern age is to try to change or ignore it rather than deal with it. Right. And so what do you mean? Tell me more about what you mean by that. One of the major, um, uh, solutions, let's say, to a lot of modern problems is just changing language because we there's an assumption that reality is a social invention or our reality is a social invention right and so if we can change the way we talk about things we'll change reality right uh and uh i think examples that we've already lived through are like participation trophies that you're a winner if you show up <laughs> right <laughs> right that's um a way to try to change our understanding of what's real. But we know uh, that's not actually how reality plays out. No, nope, there are actual losers who don't get trophies in life. That's right. I have been that and regularly still continue to, <laughs> to not that's get right. trophies. Participation <laughs> trophies are a way to change language or reward to try mm-hmm. to change our experience of reality. Right. But it doesn't change reality. Right. It change our, changes our expectation of reality. Right. And so the American life is one that tries to create a life of no storms and only pleasure. Yeah. (laughs) Pleasure and happiness are our highest form of goodness in this country. And um, I think it leaves us very ill prepared for Mm -hmm. reality. Well, and that's um, outlined in scripture too, right? There's like multiple, multiple verses. One of my favorites is in Romans, <clears throat> which is suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, mm-hmm. character, character, hope, and hope we receive through the Holy Spirit whom he has mm-hmm. given us. And um, I think that's just a defining characteristic of us as humans is that when we experience suffering, there is a refinement process that happens, especially when we utilize the words of God and put them into practice, like right here, you know, Jesus's words that he's given to us, it it transforms the way that we interact when Mm -hmm. we are experienced suffering in the world. When, when the storms around us are just life is out of control. We cannot Mm -hmm. control anything except how we respond to things. Right. 
And so, and it's hard. It is hard to show up and honor the Lord and do the right thing and not have vengeance or bitterness or resentment that lead us in the way that we interact in things, or even like um, a victim mentality and, and allowing those things to continue to, you know, um, uh, perpetuate in, in our, in our lives and experiences. So, and I think that uh, in the American mindset, it's such a double-edged sword because not all Americans think this, but there is this pocket, and I feel it in our own area sometimes, um, where it's a perception that all effort is struggle and all struggle is suffering. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't oh. think I don't think that's true, but I think that there's an attitude that says if I really have to try and like sweat and go to the mat for something. Um, that that effort is immediately um, becomes a struggle, which then becomes suffering. That right. like I'm I'm a victim if I have to try hard enough. <laughs> right, right, think, yeah, definitely. And I think that's um, totally untrue. We see effort as a part of just even pre-fall creation. Mm-hmm. That like Adam has work to do, and that work totally. takes energy and time. That's effort, but mm-hmm. that's not the same thing as struggle. We also see, though, that um, struggle it seems to be part of the human experience in a non-malicious way as well. A baby learning how to walk, a toddler learning how to talk, yeah. a baby bird having to break through its shell and learn how to fly. Mm-hmm. These things are struggles, but they're not suffering. The old example of the butterfly, right? Exactly. You break them out Great of their example. little cocoon too early, they can't fly because their wings aren't strong enough. Right. It's like such a such a beautiful example of what suffering and struggle does for us. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would classify struggle and suffering as different because struggle is I'm contending against something that takes effort, Mm -hmm. but it is um, developmental Mm -hmm. and suffering is something that is meant to harm me that I can choose to let develop me. Yep. Absolutely. And I I think that uh, we can so easily just assume that all struggle is suffering and mm-hmm. it's this real quick downhill slope where if I, have to, <laughs> if I have to try too hard, like I'm Oof, a I am out. You know, yeah. like, and that's where like grit comes into play for yeah, people. You yeah. know, that um it's just very interesting. Because sometimes kids, you see this especially in kids who are developing, is you know, if it's too hard, then they just quit. They don't yeah, want to keep yeah. trying. Um and <clears throat> there's a balance between like forcing kids to do things that they hate and yeah. uh, causing them to be resentful and encouraging kids to continue pressing into things yeah to grow right so it's it's a hard thing parents you got a heart out there you, you got a heart I mean? out there you got a so heart out there <laughs> the reason the reason though i bring up worldviews and things mm-hmm. like that is because of the last two verses when jesus yep. had finished saying these things the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of law and here's what that means i think anyway Okay, let's hear, um, it. let's hear what you think. The teachers of the law, in a very Greek kind of way, had many debates on what the scriptures meant. And so there were different denominational schools of thought on mm-hmm. how to interpret and interact with um, Jewish teaching. And so there was a lot of people's opinions being put forth and pondering about that. And uh, so you had the Sadducees, for example, who believe there's no miracles or resurrection. We would call them cessationists, Hmm. right? God did miracles and amazing things back then, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Pharisees who we would maybe call charismatics nowadays. People who totally believe in miracles. They totally believe in the power of God. They totally believe in the resurrection. They totally believe in angels and demons and spiritual warfare. Uh, and, and they're aware of those things and looking for them in their spiritual experience. And so the Pharisees, in some way, are the liberal Christians, uh, quote unquote, the, the the religious liberal of the time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the Sadducees are the religious conservatives of the time. And then you have the Zealots and the Essenes who are opposite extremists. Mm-hmm. The, the Zealots were people who were freedom fighters who thought the only way to really follow God and, and uh, enact his justice in the world was through violence. And the Essenes were people who thought the world was so broken and lost, they were just going to go out in the <laughs> desert and pray by themselves and hope for God to come back. <laughs> Hurry, Jesus, come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And what's, what's ironic is we see God use each of those groups. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Simon the Zealot is one of the 12 dis disciples. You have the Apostle Paul, who's a Pharisee. You have, um, oh, who, who am I forgetting? Oh, John the Baptist, who is in a scene, hence why he's yeah. out in the desert wearing camel's hair. <laughs> right? A scene were locus. monks. Yeah. yeah, they were yeah. monks. Yeah. They were, it was a form of monasticism. Yeah. Um, so you have all these different groups, very similar today. Um, you have the Catholics, you have the Orthodox, uh, you have the liberals, you have the conservatives, you have extremists, and they're mm -hmm. all telling people this is what it means to follow God. You have the people saying COVID-19 is the beginning of the end times and it's the sign of the beast. And you have people saying, um, no, this is all for our good and do whatever the government says and honor the government and every, everything they think and say. And then you have people saying uh, there's some kind of middle way and it's a mix of those two things. And then you have people just on all sides, all yeah, saying this yeah. is the right way to do this. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is not talking like that. Right. Jesus is not saying, hmm, I, yeah, you have a good point there. I'll have to consider that. Or hmm, I hadn't thought about the scriptures in that way. That's a really good, Jesus is saying, mm -hmm. this is what it means. This you guys is what are it is. doing this wrong. You guys, you guys got this. All <laughs> well, miss. I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's saying that necessarily, but he's not wondering what it could mean. Right. Because he's, he's saying, teaching with authority. He right. says, this is what, this, this is, is the This is what truth. it means. And yeah. that's what you feel in this last sentence. When you hear what I say mm -hmm. and do what I say, your life has a foundation that can sustain reality. And yeah. if you don't, you're a fool and your life's going to crumble. Right. <laughs> Just like, that's authority. That's like, yeah. Yeah. Wow, you got some, you got some confidence, boy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you got, yeah. You got a, you got a, a lot of assurance in what you're saying to be able to say something like that. And so they're blown away because Jesus is. This is like no religious conversation they've ever had. He's not quoting other rabbis. He's not right. saying, and we we do a, a version of this today, but this was really popular back in the day. They'd say, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and like Rabbi Heschel says this, and Rabbi, and we do the same thing today. You know, we'll say like, like G.K. Chesterton said, or like C.S. Lewis says, or like Tim Keller says, or, you know, mm -hmm. in the words of J.R. Tolkien, or, you know, whoever. Yeah. We quote our favorite people, you know, like Pete Scazzaro says, Jesus isn't doing any of that. Right. He's saying, I say, this is what it means, and this mm -hmm. is how to live. Yeah. And people are like, whoa, that is a different yeah. kind of. It struck theater. them into amazement. Like they were amazed. Yep. Yep. And mm -hmm. I think that's also just a natural reaction. I feel that way all the time, uh, just in the presence of God. I feel there are certain times when God moves and it's so true, there's nothing else to say. <clears throat> right. You know, yeah. it's just like yeah, totally. piercingly true. Yeah. And I, I get a sense that that's how they were feeling. Just this kind of piercing truth that is painful yet benign and um, is hurts, but is non-malicious. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, like a, like a doctor's scalpel or something. So um, one of the things I, I, I also wanted to talk about real briefly today. Um, so if you guys have any other questions about that text, let us know. But uh, yeah. I think that's, that's my understanding of it. That's my observation of it is that um, what Jesus is talking about here is not just like a checklist of obeying things. It is a way of viewing and understanding the world with him as the foundation, um, both relationally mm -hmm. and in our values and understanding of the way the world works. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one of the things that, that I, I talked about in our little Thanksgiving thing last week, but I just wanted to bring up again that I think is also at the heart of that is this section here. Would you mind reading that for me, Kate, verses 21 through 23? Yeah. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who says the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name, drive out demons and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. This is one of the most troubling, convicting North mm -hmm. Star scriptures to me in all of the Bible. Yeah. Um, because what is troubling to me is um, not 
but only the one who does the will of my father um, who is in heaven will enter my kingdom. Many will say, did we not prophesy, drive out demons and perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me. Meaning that there is a way to use God's power and not know God. Mm -hmm. And that what Jesus doesn't say, which is so troubling to me, is he doesn't say, I never used you. Mm. He says, I never knew you. And I wonder, I don't know what the, um, <clears throat> uh, what new he's using here. Is it like the mm. intimate know of God? Like, uh, be still and know that I am God. I just am curious question, about. This is written in Greek and, and that Hebrew word, yada. I don't know what the Greek equivalent would be. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I'm curious question, about it. Though. Yeah. That's a good question though. But it's clearly prioritizing relationship over utility. Yeah, yeah. And that, I think, to me, especially as someone in full-time ministry, is something that I um, is a North Star for me all the time, that mm -hmm. God is powerful enough to drive out demons without us. He's powerful mm -hmm. enough to do miracles without us. He's powerful enough to prophesy without us. Um, but he cannot know us without us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what he's looking for. And, and so, anyway... I, I bring that up because that's part of the foundation I think that Jesus is talking about here is right. this foundation that says it is possible to know, it is possible um, to use my power, be used by me and not know me. And yeah. that will not allow you to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's challenging, man. It's really, it really is convicting to follow the Lord and to be curious about like, am I, am I, Am I obeying him? Am I serving him? Am I supporting people in their relationship with him? And, you know, just really submitted to him on a daily and regular basis to say like, God, please direct my steps. Help mm -hmm. me to be more and more refined by mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's this dual, um, this dual formula in relationships of like a pursuing love and a undying faithfulness yeah that um are both i, I think that's where the tension lies for me and i need to be both so present to uh really love and and live with anybody for the long haul including mm -hmm. jesus yeah uh, i think it's true in marriage i think it's true in um friendships. relationships with our family mm -hmm. friendships 100 yeah. percent um mm -hmm. Because there's this verse in, as Bob talked about finding us ourselves faithful um, and, and remaining faithful on Sunday, I, I thought of um, the chaplain at my uh, school, my college I went to, that he would quote this verse in Second Chronicles. I don't remember the, the passage address right now, but he would say, um, the eyes of the Lord range to and fro across the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And Ron Capico would always say, and my question every day is, Lord, do they stop on me? Mm. Your eyes stop on me. Is my heart fully committed to you today? Find me faithful, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And um, I love that. And I love to, uh, I'm reading Experiencing God right now by Henry Blackaby, excellent workbook. I'd highly recommend it for anyone looking for a great devotional I just got my resource. copy. Oh, yeah! I'm good. so pumped about it. Yeah, I might want some videos if you have them. I do. Okay. I do have them. Keep going. Um, Keep going. Experience. Yeah, I watched a couple. Videos. They're a little cheesy. We'll see. I'm going to review okay. a couple more. Okay. Well, then though. maybe never mind. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to poo poo on them yet because okay. I haven't yeah. done enough. Yeah. Uh, watching them, we'll see. Um, yeah. But the devotional um, long story and the workbook short, are great. Yeah. Long story short, one of the things that he says in the workbook is um, that the aim of the Christian life is to fall more in love with Jesus, mm -hmm. to know and obey and to love God. And that they're almost like a staircase, right? Like a spiral staircase upward. When I come um, to know God, I love God. And when I love God, I obey God. And when I mm -hmm. obey God, I come to know God more deeply, which then leads me to deeper love for him and deeper obedience of him. Like the spiral staircase up yeah you know yeah that's beautiful that's the that's the goal of the christian life my friends 
So welcome to the journey. Here we are. We're doing it together. And that's what I love the thing. most about it. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I think that I it's know. challenging and um, encouraging and just the whole, that's the best part for me, right? I'm mm-hmm. so relational. <laughs> mm-hmm. So thanks you for showing up here really? today, guys. I know. Oh. I know. It's a surprise. Yeah. I'm shocked. Yeah. This is my okay. shocked face. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you all the information <laughs> you need. Thanks. I appreciate that. Way to help me out. Yeah. Thanks for being on the journey with us, you guys. Thanks for tuning in today. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, let us know. Uh, We would love to hear how you um, felt about the A New Way to Be Human series. And we will see you next week as we kick off Christmas.